So, um, just a quick note on methodology for this one. So it was multimodal in terms of method, very reliant on qualitative research. We spoke to about 250 people across Australia and there was about 350 hours of interviewing that we did. So we spoke to people as young as 10, boys and girls. We spoke to parents, we spoke to older siblings, grandparents and other influences like teachers, sporting coaches across Australia. Every state and territory was included and we spoke um, to people in metro, regional and remote locations as well. There's a number of different techniques that we use, which I'll just explain very quickly um, before we go into it, because some parts of the presentation hinge on this. One of the um, techniques is that we use some vignettes or some little stories about some occurrences of disrespectful or aggressive behaviour. There are three examples that we use. One was based on some verbal aggression between a boy, group of boys and a group of girls. Another one, there was a little bit of physical um, aggression as well, so verbal followed by throwing the bottle at the girls. And then the third one was more mental intimidation, so some boys forcing some girls to look at some inappropriate photos on their phones. In all three of those scenarios, the starting point was that nobody knew each other, so it was very clear that they were strangers to each other as we went through. And a lot of the research comes from what we unpacked through that and getting people to finish the stories and tell us what was happening in the background. But the starting point for this research was essentially an influencer strategy, which is why we talked to a lot of adults. So how can we get the Australian community, how can we get adults as influencers to be influential in helping to shape positive attitudes and beliefs among younger Australians? So it's a primary prevention strategy that we're talking about. So I guess the starting point really was, you know, is the role of an influencer strategy actually endorsed? Do we actually think there's a need for it? Will it work? We also spoke to some service providers as well and fundamentally what we saw was that the need for a primary prevention influencer strategy was very widely endorsed. So service providers endorse it on a number of levels. They see the need for a primary prevention strategy. They see the need to target influencers first rather than just going di only directly to children. They see great benefit in having consistency, so having multiple voices, including targeting by settings, so not just individuals, but also you know, schools, sports grounds, etc. The other reason that service providers think that there will be benefit of an influencer strategy is that this kind of strategy really would rely on personal relationships and leveraging personal relationships. And from a counselling perspective, that's when often the most benefits are obtained when you're trying to influence someone's attitudes and beliefs. Young people also see the need for um, an influencer strategy and there's two reasons for that. One is young people certainly don't want to lecture. They don't want to be told um, what to do. So if it's about a learning environment or a way that they can learn which is not a lecture and is not just about information, they're more likely to respond positively. The other reason is that um, similar to service providers, they certainly see the need for consistency. At the moment, a lot of young people see inconsistency across the community. They see people telling them to do one thing but then themselves doing something completely different. So they recognise that that could be very positive um, if there was better consistency or greater consistency across the community. So of course there's multiple layers of influence and we tried to uncover how influential some of these different categories may be. This was from um, one of the um, quantitative questions in the online survey that we did with about a thousand young people. And basically we just tried to understand who of these people would be influential in something that was pretty important to them. So the first layer of influence is what we would call close others. So the way to read this, um, among the young people that we spoke to, 77% of them said that their mother would be, would be pretty influential if it was about a topic that was important. So you can see mothers are at the top, but basically within that close others bucket, you've got family, you know, you've got grandparents, you've got siblings as well, and you've also got close peers. There's a few differences, um, expected differences by um, gender. So for example, young females are more likely to say their female peers would be influential than male peers. Um, and essentially, there are some differences by age as well. So parents stay similarly influential regardless of whether you're 10 or 25, which was the range of the survey, but peers become progressively more influential the older you get. So what that means is that the gap between the influence of parents, which when you're younger, parents are much more influential, compared to when you're a little bit older, in your 20s, starts to reduce. The next layer of influence is what we call setting influences or setting others. 
And these are settings which if you are connected to them as a young person, so if you do play sport and you have a sporting coach, your sporting coach will be quite influential on you. Um, if you do go to a place of worship, the leaders at that place of worship will be quite influential. There are a few significant differences across some of these settings as well. So um, sport as a setting, but also coaches as an influence are much more influential on young males and very influential on Indigenous males as well. Places of worship were particularly influential for those of a called background. Music coaches, and that included dance coaches and drama coaches as well, were more influential for young females. The next layers of influence, we start to go a little bit further out, but they're still nonetheless quite influential on young people, particularly in the way they talk about them. So other things in the community, well-known people in sports clubs, musicians, actors, but also people on social media, even brands in social media are considered quite important and quite influential on the way that young people think. Of course, with these influences, so we may know who they are, um, but how do young people perceive them in a situation that we describe about disrespectful or aggressive behaviour? And how do these influences actually describe themselves? How do they think they would respond? There seems to be a fairly negative territory at the moment and in what we would call quite an ineffective territory. Um, but equally, each of our influencer groups have what is potentially quite a positive um, area or a positive way that they could be influential. If we look at mothers or fathers, when we ask young people, you know, in this situation, how do you think your mother would respond? How do you think your father would respond? The vast majority for mothers um, think that their mother would probably have quite emotional response or she might give them a lecture. And that for a lot of young people was considered something that would probably be quite ineffective. Similarly with fathers, a lot of people thought that they might punish them or they might be quite aggressive and get involved, maybe escalate the situation. Young people tend to describe this kind of response as something that's quite easy to ignore. It might be uncomfortable, you might not actually want it, you don't want to get yelled at, but actually you don't really learn that much from it, you don't take that much away from it, it's quite easy to dismiss. Whereas if your parents can be um, in the more calm kind of sitting down and having a conversation territory, that is when they become very effective as a moral compass or as a calm kind of protective kind of um, influencer. We then also have um, people who are potentially um, closer in age to the young person, so older siblings and also peers. Older sisters in particular were considered quite influential and one of the reasons for that was that there was a perception that older sisters probably had gone through an experience similar themselves. From the young male's perspective, there was a desire to avoid upsetting their sister by maybe, you know, bringing this back into her memory. And from a younger sister perspective, it was, you know, she would probably understand what I was going through, so they were considered quite influential. Peers at the moment are almost exclusively sitting in that avoider segment. So peers are really avoiding getting involved. If they see one of their friends exhibiting disrespectful or aggressive behaviour, there's very low likelihood that they will do anything. On the flip side though, if they do get involved, um, they are considered very effective. And we'll talk a little bit more about the reasons why peers are potentially so effective in a moment. If we move to some of the setting influences, again, some of these are quite influential. So coaches are described as very influential to particularly young boys who are connected to a sporting club. One of the reasons that comes through quite strongly for that is that young boys tend to describe the relationship with their coach or you know, the reason that they go to play sport. There's an intrinsic desire to please because you're there to win. You're there to try and make your coach happy and to try and please your teammates as well. So if you are doing something that does not please your coach, it was considered to be something that could be quite a dissuader to not participate in disrespectful or aggressive behaviour towards girls. The other reason is that the coach may evoke what is considered a fairly visible display of punishment. So you may get benched or you may not be allowed to play the next game. And then all of a sudden, all of your teammates know that you've done something wrong. Teachers were considered quite influential, although interestingly, one of the big differences between teachers and coaches is that teachers, and we've described them as a passive punisher because there is a perception, so not necessarily reality, but there is a perception that teachers will get involved in a situation because it's part of their job and because they have to. Whereas when they describe coaches, they think that they will get involved because they want to, because there's a desire to be there. They're probably not getting paid for it, they're doing it because they want to get involved. 
Managers are considered really um, quite influential as well by young people and one of the reasons for that is their proximity of age to the young person. So in some of the companies that we um, spoke to as one of the components of the research, they indicated that the average age of their store manager was 21 years old and they had about 30,000 young people aged um, 15 to 18 years. So you can see they're quite young, um, connected in terms of age. Also, they might cut your shifts or you know, send you home for the day if you're caught doing something disrespectful or aggressive in the workplace. Teammates and workmates are almost identical to peers, um, almost exclusively in that avoider category at the moment. One of the things that we like to show you is the potential power of influence. So it's one thing to know who the influencers are, but do we think that a strategy like this would actually have merit? Would it actually achieve anything? One of the parts of the research that we did um, was a four hour session where we had a mix of people in the room. So we had young people, young boys and girls, and we had adult influencers, females and males in the room at the same time. It was four hours where we challenged them to talk to each other in a way that they probably hadn't done before. So girls don't typically talk to boys about this topic, vice versa. Um, boys probably don't often talk to their mothers about this um, and vice versa. So we were kind of trying to be disruptive and get people to talk to about it. And we asked them to write a letter to themselves before the session and then we asked them to write themselves a letter after the session as well. This is one example. Um, this person was a 15-year-old boy who came to the group and this was really consistent across everyone that was in the room. So you can see in the before letters, they're all talking about things like, oh, I'm not quite sure what this is, I'm a bit tired, is there going to be food, I'm quite hungry, what is this all about? And then you can see the real um, process of cognition and active learning which has happened throughout the night. So by the end of the session, he's saying, after this session, I've learnt so much by far out of my expectations. It was a really good night and changed my opinion on the topic and taught me that fighting fire with fire is never right and there is a much better option. Sexism is evident even without being recognised and just seen as everyday life and how much an effect we can have on the future generation. So you can see that power of cognition of influence when you can actually get young people and adults having conversations. Of course, it's one thing to know who the influencers are and the fact that an influencer strategy has um, potentially quite a lot of power, but then how do we actually get influencers on board? How do we engage influencers? And this is what, where the next part of the research takes us to. When we go into this territory, this is where we identify another, uh, a number of different challenges. So the first challenge, 96% of us condemn domestic violence. So this is from some national statistics data. But there's a very strong wall of heuristics that prevents us from recognising the heart of the challenge. Now, heuristics are things that we think um, unconsciously, we're probably not even realising that we're doing it. They just kick in in certain situations. We're not even aware that they're happening. And what happens, and I'll talk to you through what they are, they prevent us from recognising what's actually happening here in terms of the heart. So there are three key heuristics which I'll talk you through. The first one is what we call victim blame. So when we posed a situation of the disrespectful behaviour that was happening between the boys and the girls, um, one of the first things that people say when we say, what do you think was happening here? The first territory they go to is, well, she, that girl must have done something. So we've established from the outset that nobody knows each other, they've never met each other before, but one of the first things that a lot of people jump to is, well, she, something must have happened earlier that day, they must have known each other, like I can't understand why he would do that without a reason. So you start, people start to say things like, well, it takes two to tango, well, what did the girl do? The young boys are saying this as well, and also the young girls are saying this. So girls as you know, young as 10 are saying things, well, you wouldn't tell anyone because it's probably your fault. You might not know why, but you're going to assume it's, it's your fault. So you'll stay quiet because you don't want to make it any worse. So this automation of victim blaming and jumping straight to that kind of conclusion happens relatively quickly. We then move to what we call minimisation. So after we say, well, um, she must have done something, something must have happened, we then kind of go, well, it's not actually, it's not that bad. Um, you know, yeah, he yelled at her, but it's, it's, not, it's not really that bad, is it? And again, it's adults who are saying this and it's young people who are saying this as well. The example that I like to use here is um, the quote down the bottom, which was a 10-year-old girl um, who I interviewed, came with her parents, they were all very articulate, parents had professional jobs. After we read through the scenarios, the, the girl, 10 years old, said, well, you know, it, if he punches you once or twice, it's not, it's not really that nice, but it's not, it's not wrong. 
if he punches you and you end up with scars all over your face and you're in hospital and you're in a lot of pain, then it's wrong. So this it, it kind of consistency and very quick automatic response to minimise disrespectful behaviour between boys and girls and some forms of aggression is happening very quickly. It's one of the first things that we do and it is certainly being picked up by young people as well. The third one is empathy. So after we move through, well, something must have happened. She must have done something. And you know, it's not actually that bad. Then we move to, you know what, it's, it's really tough being a boy. It's very tough being a boy. All these hormones, they, they don't know how to deal with their emotions. It's really tough. And we tend to empathise, therefore, with the male rather than with the female in these experiences. Again, it's the adult influencers are saying this, it's the boys who are saying this, and it's also the young girls who are saying this as well. So what happens as a result of those three common heuristics for young males, um, it's a pattern that is kind of starting to form and they're risking undertaking and potentially continuing some of these behaviours relatively unchallenged and they're externalising the issue because there's no reflection on themselves, it's all about other factors. For young females, um, in contrast, they're internalising the experience and the issue, they're accepting the behaviour and they're forming a fairly early norm for tolerance and acceptance. And for adults as influencers, um, what it means is that we're avoiding getting involved and being influential and we're potentially confusing the boundaries of what's acceptable and what's unacceptable in these situations for young people. So changing these heuristics, these automatic things that are happening that we're not even necessarily aware of and we're not aware, we're not thinking through the implications of them, they're just happening very automatically, um, certainly requires disruption and cognitive processing, active learning. We almost have to relearn some of these things that have become so innate that we're not even realising that we're doing them anymore. Of course, when there are strong heuristics, one of the reasons we sometimes have heuristics um, is to protect ourselves. So maybe there are some potentially high costs that we're, we're thinking of getting involved, but they're often a protective mechanism. And in this case, what we saw was some fairly high perceptions around the personal cost of being influential and the personal cost of engaging, which I'll talk you through next. Fundamentally, for young females and for adult influencers, when you talk about um, scenarios of disrespectful or aggressive behaviour. It is about cost, it's about loss. Um, whereas for young males, when you talk to them, it is quite often about gaining, gaining something, gaining identity. So if we start off with fathers and mothers first and um, loss or personal costs of being influential, um, there are a number of different things. So fathers are often concerned about jeopardising their relationship with their child if they get involved. Some fathers are concerned about potentially being exposed as a hypocrite. Um, they are potentially concerned about causing some conflict with other parents and about escalating the situation by getting involved. Mothers describe similar things. So mothers have relatively high threat appraisal. So they start to say things like, well, um, boys, if they're 15 year olds, can be quite big. So if I went to intervene or to have a conversation or to try and stop something happening, um, they might actually turn around and hurt me. So I've got to think about my own personal safety as well. Mothers are also worried about embarrassing their child or scaring their child by elevating it, by making it seem like it is a significant issue that you should be concerned about. Some mothers are concerned that it may be a reflection of poor parenting. And people are also concerned about social exclusion. So there is a fear that if you stand up and you say that what you've observed is incorrect or you don't agree with it, that you'll be the only person saying this and that you might be um, labelled the prude of the school because you will be the only person who's standing up highlighting this as something that you disagree with. For young females, it's about loss as well. So loss or compromising your identity. Loss of control during the situation, loss of esteem, loss of friendship. But it's also about respect. And when we think about respect for young females, when they're experiencing disrespectful or aggressive behaviour, they're concerned about the respect of their friends. They're also concerned about the respect of the boys who may be um, being aggressive or disrespectful towards them. So they're concerned about how they respond. Do I look cool? How should I respond? Um, but they are also very concerned about losing the respect of their parents. So they describe um, the situation or the, the chapter of their life that they're in as one where they're trying to be independent and to show to the world and to their parents that they are independent and they're progressing towards adulthood. Um, fundamentally, they are concerned that if they disclose that they were involved in something like this, 
or that they felt vulnerable, they would be telling their parents that they were in fact dependent rather than independent and then they would have loss of control. For young males, when we ask them, what do you think was happening in this situation? How do you think these guys feel when they're doing it? It is about gaming. It is about gaining popularity, so extending your friendship network. It is about gaining power, so gaining social power within your social circle, elevating your social status. Sometimes it can also be about release as well. So if, if you have problems at home or if there is something, some other stressor in your life, um, it may be a valid way to release some of that pressure. It is also about what we call an affective reward though. So there is a sense that there is probably an emotional reward for participating in some of these behaviours. And that emotional reward happens at different stages throughout the experience. So it happens both during the experience where they might be um, being disrespectful to a girl or being aggressive towards a girl. And it also seems to last after the experience as well when they describe what it would feel like afterwards. We tried to get a sense from young males about was there any cost involved? Are there any personal costs involved in term, if you participate in behaviours like this? It took a while and quite a lot of cognitive processing to try and get to this. It certainly wasn't one of the first things that they were able to articulate. Of course, when you think about cost, there's two ways you can think about it. Impact on yourself, cost to yourself, or impact on other people, cost to others. Um, when they do get to that point, some males will think about the cost to themselves first, a potential cost. And the cost is basically, if um, it doesn't make me look good in front of my friends, if it doesn't get me more friends, if it doesn't elevate my social status, then that's a potential cost because I might not get what I'm actually looking for. When they think about costs on others, some of them are able to articulate that it may be an uncomfortable experience for the girl, but generally when they're talking about this, it's through a reflection of themselves rather than th through a reflection of the girl. So they're saying things like, he might be feeling cruel, he might be feeling like a bully, rather than she might be feeling bullied. And so it's generally from a perspective of themselves. So there's a lot of cost for influencers in getting involved and challenging these costs will require establishing a stronger link to the problem. That disrespectful and aggressive behaviour can lead to domestic violence, not always. Um, but also it's about establishing the costs of not engaging as well. So as influencers, the majority of us at the moment are thinking about the costs of engaging, but not the costs of not engaging. The next kind of section is about um, reconciling our, our perpetuation of the social norm that accepts some of these warning sign behaviours. So when we tried to get an understanding of what's normal, when, like where's the line, when is something acceptable, when is something not acceptable, um, there's a number of distinct differences in the way that people describe what is acceptable for young males and what is acceptable for young females and what's normal, where, what are the boundaries. For young males, aggression is rarely identified as the issue. There's generally always seemed to be a reason why a young male would be being disrespectful or aggressive. Whereas for young females, it's generally um, stated that, well, provocation is regularly the issue. The girls must be the reason why this is happening. Young males are generally given the benefit of the doubt and are innocent until proven guilty, whereas females are given the burden of proof and are guilty until proven innocent. For young boys, it's generally described that doing these things is, you know, it's a part of growing up. It's a part of how you learn right from wrong. Whereas for young females, experiencing these things is how you develop coping mechanisms. It's part of life. It will be a part of your life for a very long time and you need to learn how to be resilient to this is the way that people describe it. For young males, it's considered okay, it's appropriate to defend yourself from a girl, to retaliate if she started something. For young females, it's generally considered the smartest thing to do is just to be silent and it's not considered okay to retaliate or to try and defend yourself. So for young males, you know, you minimise what you've done, you deflect whose responsibility, whose fault it is, is generally perception that there's no cost of participating in these behaviours where it's kind of the opposite for girls. You ignore, you avoid, you don't tell anyone because there are high costs of disclosing. What that means is that there's some um, specific distinctions that underpin what's acceptable in terms of actual behaviours. So um, if you're retaliating, it's generally considered acceptable. If you have a reason, any reason why, it is generally considered acceptable. If it's a, you know, a short-lived offence or it's not not that bad, there's no long-term impact, it's probably okay. Um, there's 
there was quite a lot of discussion about if you have a nice motive. So if he likes you, it's probably okay. He's just doing it because he likes you. He doesn't know how to, you know, communicate this in any other way. That's probably okay. If you're yelling to be heard or if you're not yelling, if, you're, if it's a generalised kind of statement rather than picking on someone in particular, if it's a one-off, and also if it happens in private rather than if it happens in public, that's particularly evident when we're talking to called and Indigenous communities as well. Um, and basically what's happening is that this kind of acceptance of a lot of these behaviours is being um, perpetuated by influencers. Peers are basically saying, well, it'd be pretty unusual to get involved. You wouldn't, if you saw something like that, you wouldn't get involved. And adults are pretty much saying the same thing. So going back to those three heuristics where we're dismissing it and we're actively not getting involved and therefore passively kind of condoning the behaviour. So one of the things is that influencers need to reconcile their role in perpetuating the problem before they can be influential. And it's almost about, you know, participating in our own rescue. And sometimes that means that stopping some behaviours is just as valuable as starting some new behaviours. Of course, before they respond, influencers will also need to feel increased control over the problem. So at the moment, there's low self-efficacy or low confidence in actually getting involved. Um, and it's lowest among parents with mothers and fathers. So fathers generally describe that they feel ill-equipped. They're not really sure how to acknowledge the problem. So they'll say things like, you know, the hardest option is actually to sit down calmly and, and talk about it. The easy thing to do is just to blame the girl's action rather than to have to acknowledge that there's a problem. And part of the reason for that is because they don't actually know what the solution is. If you acknowledge a problem, you need to be able to, you know, try. you want to try and fix it. But if you're not sure what the solution is, then it becomes quite difficult. And they also feel that it's quite difficult to talk to other parents. Mothers describe very similar things. Um, and they also feel quite disempowered. So a lot of the time, mothers will look for someone in authority. So if it happens in a school environment, they will say, um, the teacher should get involved or the principal should help address this and they will try um, to look for ways for people to get involved um, that doesn't necessarily involve themselves. Some of our other influencers have slightly higher levels of confidence but they still struggle. There's basically two reasons why some of our other influencers have higher levels of confidence. One of those is because they probably have some protocols or processes in their role. Um, if they went through some training as a coach or a group leader or a manager in a workplace or a teacher, but they probably also have some support networks or other people in their workplace they can talk to about it and see how other people have dealt with it in the past. But they still have low self-efficacy overall, particularly for female influencers in talking to young males in particular. Um, but there is a sense that they may not understand the full picture. They don't know the full issue. Do I really want to get caught up in this? Am I trying to resolve an incident or am I trying to help this person through whatever the underlying problem is? Um, what outcome am I actually trying to achieve? What am I trying to resolve? And how involved am I supposed to be? So there's still a sense of low self-efficacy. The other part of efficacy is um, response efficacy, which is if I do get involved and I do try and have a conversation or I do try and be influential, what is the likely outcome of that? So what will happen if I do get involved? And there is generally a sense of low response efficacy as well. So mothers are concerned and, you know, parents generally are concerned that if you step in, are you actually weakening your child? Are you wrapping them up in cotton wool? Do they actually need to learn how to deal with these kinds of things themselves? Am I doing the right thing by getting involved? And back to the point that we spoke about before, about girls um, trying to, in this chapter of their life, become independent. They want their parents to think that they're independent. So by disclosing this and getting adults involved, are they actually going to have the reverse impact of what they're trying to achieve? So addressing low self-efficacy can be achieved by two things. One is by elevating the costs of not being involved. And the second is by providing information and resources and content to help them get involved, so to help them learn and educate. Just a quick note on um, called and Indigenous. So there is certainly a clear need for intervention um, in addition to cultural contextualisation of this strategy. So the role for a primary prevention influencer strategy, it certainly has a role to play for called and Indigenous communities, but standalone would be insufficient to address um, the challenge in these communities. And there's four reasons for this. One of the reasons is that there are highly elevated cultural sensitivities which don't necessarily exist in the mainstream um, communities or non-cold and non-Indigenous participants. 
So there's some sensitivities which are specific to cultural groups which would need to be considered and cannot be addressed through an influencer strategy. They require intervention. The next is about the extremity of acceptable behaviour. So one of the stimulus that we used in the research was um, an international campaign which is called What Colour is the Dress? It features a woman on a billboard. She has, she's an attractive woman, she has an attractive dress on but she has bruises all over her body. Um, and in some of the interviews with Indigenous and call participants, there were repeated comments about, well, if I saw someone walking down the street with bruises like that, um, a, like, what's the problem? I bet you she didn't even have to go to hospital. Like, why would you just... I don't understand what the problem is. Or why is she wearing a dress? Why didn't she have jeans on? And she, she should have put better makeup on to cover it up. I don't, I don't understand. So the extremity of what is considered acceptable is quite different to what we saw in um, a lot of the other research. There's also a greater acceptance of concealment. So um, generally there's a sense that if it happens in private, it is a completely different issue and an influencer strategy won't have any um, or would, is likely to have very little effect on that um, because it's only when it really happens in public where the whole sense of bringing shame to the family is considered important. The fourth reason is just the sheer prevalence of violence against women in many called and Indigenous communities. And we know that statistically that it is a lot more prevalent in terms of their experience of um, violence in, in these communities. Um, so just a couple of things to finish off. Um, in order to take this forward, we certainly do need to be emotionally challenged, but we need to be feeling leading empowered, like there's actually something we can do, like we can have an influence on this. And there's some potential juxtapositions that could be considered in this. One, you know, on the left-hand side, we've got the things which are kind of, it's currently where people seem to be sitting on the right-hand thing is kind of the opposite of that, where potentially we need to be thinking about it more in that space. So at the moment, you know, to avoid getting involved and to kind of um, perpetuate without even realising that we're doing it or that we're playing a role seems to be quite comfortable for most people. So, but really, um, it should be quite uncomfortable to perpetuate this cycle of violence. Um, you know, is it about building resilience and acceptance? Is it about a learning experience, disrespectful and aggressive behaviour between young people? Um, or is it actually about building non-acceptance? Should we not be accepting this um, in young people? You know, 96% of Australians condemn domestic violence. We say that it's wrong. We think that we stand against it. But on some level, are we actually standing it for because we're tacitly condoning it by passively um, responding or not responding to these situations? And, you know, from an influencer perspective, is it actually about influencing others or really is it about first thinking about ourselves and changing ourselves and the potential role that we are unconsciously playing in this? So that leaves us to the fundamental challenge um, and this is what the strategy comes down to. Um, so recognise is about those unconscious heuristics, victim blaming, minimisation and empathy for the male that we do unconsciously without even realising it, that do have a big impact on the way that boys and girls perceive these situations. We need to reconcile the, co the particularly the personal costs that we perceive of getting involved. So we think there's high costs of getting involved and being influential and we're therefore inadvertently kind of perpetuating some of these norms of what's acceptable behaviour. Um, we need to help um, influencers respond, so we need to increase self-efficacy. And this message needs to be reinforced um, across the community. Consistency is really important. And this is where having multiple messages, consistency across the community, among organisations, individuals, brands, as many places as we can to try and reinforce the message. <laughs>